afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to this session on gender, sex, and sexuality. I, just, I have an announcement to make before we start. We have a change of speaker. Unfortunately, Patrick Ettenis was unable to join us today, but we're very fortunate to have Nigel Huller and Michaela Morris from the UK. So we have four speakers as planned, but just slightly different speakers. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Mary Michael, who's the Vice President of Patient Advocacy and Stakeholder Management at Otsuka American Pharmaceutical Incorporated. Over the course of her career, Mary has taken a creative approach to work that embraces a, single, a simple but powerful idea we must listen to, understand, and truly engage the communities we serve. Her fundamental priority is to connect, collaborate, and create within the communities being served in order to drive new collaboration, spark innovation, and generate new solutions for people who need them. And Mary's vision is to change how healthcare companies and the pharmaceutical industry both understand and meet the needs of the people they serve. So over to you, Mary. Excellent. I always have to lower this. Um, I'm going to keep a timer here so that I don't take too much time. Thank you so much for inviting me to present uh, some of the work. There we go. Um, so we actually uh, created uh, a, a white paper, and it was around hear our voices, right? And hearing our voices, this was in collaboration with Dementia Action Alliance, which is a um, patient advocacy uh, organization in the United States. And it's, you know, it was, uh, their motto is don't do anything with a, for us without us, right? And so... At first, we, we said, okay, what, we need to amplify the voices of these individuals that are living with, as well as the care partners, right? And we also understand that a lot of, well, the dementia community itself is marginalized, right? And then you have marginalized communities or subpopulations within that community. And so what we wanted to do was collect all of those insights and then amplify them. And so we actually pivoted from the very first paper from hearing our voices to calling all voices. And the whole premise behind that is we want individuals to step up and share their perspective. I think that we can all agree that when you talk to one person that's, that has a dementia journey or a care partner journey, it's just one, right? But collectively, I think if there is a basis of understanding through some sort of cultural you know, commonality, this can really kind of be a very powerful um, voice for the community. So our aim is to not only hear them, hear those voices, but to amplify and really create a conversation around it. So calling all voices today is looking at LGBTQ plus community and our paper is on our gcad.net um, website. Tomorrow my poster is going to be looking at the African American community. So let's talk about the uh, research methodology. It's quite simple. We started talking to people. We started, and, and it's unfortunate that Patrick couldn't be here because he was one of our interviewees. And what we wanted to do was get that singular perspective from the lived experiences. And then we said, well, what is out in the literature about LGBTQ plus community regarding dementia? No surprise, it wasn't a whole lot. So what we wanted to do was capture some of the major insights regarding these interviews and the qualitative research. And it really was driven more by the, the, the interviews. There is a lack of community. Let's talk about that for a second. When you're talking about LGBTQ plus community, just like with any other community, there are gonna be some special circumstances. Unfortunately, in that particular community, sometimes they are isolated from their birth families you know, from uh, a lack of acceptance from their status. And so because of that, they're trying to find community because they're oftentimes joining dementia, you know, groups or support groups and what have you, but no one really understands sort of the issues that they're having to deal with on a daily basis. There's bias in medical and medical and care settings. Let's talk about that for a second. I was just talking to Barry that in the United States, I think it was Trevor Project, um, agnostic to the disease, just in the United States, I think I heard a statistic that 
upwards of maybe 20% of clinicians um, refuse to give care to somebody from the LGBTQ. I mean, I'm talking about medical care. I don't understand that, but apparently that attitude still exists. I actually appreciate anybody who was brave enough to actually admit that so that we actually know what we have to overcome. So I take, you know, I think like the glass half full person here. So I think it's good to understand where, where the barriers are so that we can hopefully overcome them. And then there's a lack of supported diagnosis. This is, this is true for anybody that gets a dementia diagnosis, but it's probably more especially true for the individuals in the LGBTQ community because they really are lacking a lot of support and resources. So let's talk about the responses, right? It's almost one-to-one. -one. We know that there's a lack of community, so let's start creating a community. And that's exactly what a lot of our interviewees did. They started creating subsets within big dementia groups for the LGBTQ plus community so they could have pertinent conversations, relative conversations to the issues that they were having to deal with. They started advocating for themselves and others. So once you have one person step up, then others will join and then you start to have a chorus of voices from different perspectives, whether it's lesbian, gay, trans, whatever the special needs might be of that particular community, that starts to get amplified. And I think that other people are kind of like, oh my gosh, we can't overlook this. So I think it's very important that that, that work started. And then they started embracing life with dementia. I will say that this is kind of a common theme in the dementia community. I hear about individuals agnostic to your background, your cultural background, who find kind of a new beginning with their diagnoses. Um, I was talking to a physician whose uh, father became an artist who has sold art post-dementia. You have a lot of people finding their voices, literally and figuratively, in music, in other types of expression that maybe um, is more conducive to the, to the dementia that they're living with. So um, you, we hear a lot of stories about people embracing life with dementia in different ways than you would env envision. So first and foremost, I really like to thank, and you know, it's kind of interesting when you work in patient advocacy, I, I'm, I don't like the word, you know, thank you for your, being so brave to share your story. It's not really bravery because bravery is what you do every single day when you live with any kind of medical condition. It's really generosity, right? It's about generosity of sharing your perspective, sharing those pain points, sharing your journey so that other people can learn. I work in the rare disease category as well, and I hear from individuals, it's like, it's so nice to know that I'm not the only one and there's someone else like me. So we can all learn and have a communal learning experience. So I want to thank the individuals that uh, generously gave to us their perspectives. So um, I think I talked about some of the um, barriers of finding community. There is a history of discrimination. I think especially in the gay population, we don't have to go too far in history to talk about HIV and AIDS, right? Um, this kind of feels a little bit similar, right? Because during the HIV AIDS um, epidemic, uh, I think gay men especially had to really create their own communities of support because especially, you know, 34 years ago, I think, um, there was even greater discrimination and greater isolation and lack of support, at least overt support. And so um, in, the, in the absence of that and in the absence of family, blood family, relatives of being support, I think that they've always had to lean in. The only difference is, and Barry and I talked about this, is that, is that there's an added level of, um, let's say, uh, stigma attached to, to dementia. So it doesn't matter what community you're from, nobody wants to admit that they've got a dementia diagnosis. And so um, that makes it a little bit more complex because it might take an individual longer to get to that diagnosis, especially when we talk about the barriers. And lack of community-oriented resources. You know, I've spoken with um, individuals who are living alone. 
and they're like, how do I survive alone and how do I hack dementia, right? They rely on devices like this to kind of help them and all that kind of stuff. However, they find other communities. There's this one gentleman in the U.S. that I spoke with who worked with a, um, a, a, it's a, it's a black sorority that has a graduate chapter and they adopted not only him, but the cause of dementia for people living alone. So you can see that there was inspiration from the LGBTQ plus community that actually benefits more people and a lot of people who are living alone with this condition. So um, we talked about overcoming the barriers. Let me just go to the next um, because I'm running out of time. Um, I could talk about this all day long, by the way. Uh, we talked about bias and discrimination in healthcare and medical settings. I wanted to share a couple of quotes because ultimately this is what I'm trying to do is trying to amplify the individuals and I think that it probably would not, I, I could not do this without their voices. So here's a couple of quotes I think um, on an absent or distant family that we heard. Not everybody in the gay community has a birth family that supports them. Many of us are disowned because our families don't want to be involved in what they call a lifestyle. In the gay community, there is not always a family of origin that you can turn to. Um, in terms of the lack of community-oriented re um, resources, again, another quote, after the diagnosis, I found some support groups, but they were very geriatric-oriented. They were all happening at the senior care center, and there was certainly nothing LGBTQ+. I just didn't feel like it, that it was for us or for me. So, you know, in this message of, or this time of inclusivity, I think we really have to be inclusive of all, you know, um, people from all different backgrounds, and we cannot forget the LGBTQ plus uh, community, because oftentimes they're dealing with multiple cultural points, right? So um, I'm going to, There we go. So here's the call to action. Let's help them create community, help all create community. And um, let's stand up against bias. So if you hear about the bias, please stand up against it. And let's educate, inform, and share some of these voices and fill that resource gap. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. We'll, we'll answer any questions in the Q&A. But thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, and as regarding questions, if anybody has any questions also from the virtual audience, please don't hesitate to put them onto the app so that we can share them at the end of the, the session. So I'd like to welcome the next speaker, Aud Johansson from Norway, who's going to speak about how gender matters in demanding caring for a spouse with young onset dementia is a narrative study. Um, thank you for being able to present one of my studies. Uh, it is actually a bit difficult to see the without uh, on this one, so I don't really. I yes, please. Um, so I have to. Would you like a microphone instead? Yes, please. Could could you have a microphone here? A handheld one. Uh, of oh. or swing that around. After quite a while, I started to think about uh, from working with uh, relatives for quite a time. Uh, I. Are the, is it on? Is it on? Is it okay now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> And how do I move it? The green one. Okay. Uh, I started to, to realize that it was different between how much uh, the caregivers uh, got of help or support of different kinds and different needs. And of course, at this symposium, there's more than gender to realize, what to think about, to meet people in, in the way and how, what they need. 
it's important, the person center. It doesn't matter uh, women and men and gay and uh, it's important to to do meet the needs, but we have different needs. So in this study, um, uh, we, we looked at uh, especially the women and saw how they what they needed during this process being a caregiver. And then I focused on ten women and uh, six men, uh, and this study was done in for a few years ago. Uh, the mean age, uh, they were young people with dementia, and the caregivers were also young. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I'm sorry. So I analyzed uh, these uh, spouses' uh, experiences, uh, and all of them had the frontal temporal dementia. And uh, as most, many of you know, that is a special diagnosis and other demands, perhaps, in the beginning of the dementia disease. Uh, so I analyzed it in a qualitative way and <coughs> had a special focus on the women and the dif differences. Um, I found that uh, it was difference in the caregivers' periods, and being young, uh, a caregiver to a frontotemporal dementia, it, it had uh, also an effect on how or if they could uh, go to work. Um, and it had to do with distancing, and social isolation was a consequence and uh, needing assistance and relief. And that is also the same for uh, people with uh, dementia in general, but in specific this, these uh, spouses, uh, it's uh, really hard to be in that situation. So when you have to look after others, you also, you, you also are being is isolated because you can't do what you like to do. Uh, their symptoms uh, had been there for many, many years, as we have heard earlier this, uh, these days. And they have been living in that situation for many, many years. Uh, and they, they, it seems like the men got uh, help earlier than the women. And the they women needed other uh, other support than the men. Combining, uh, combining caring and working was very difficult. So the 20% of the were working full time, the rest were on disability benefits. And two was full time, and then you see what consequences that is had on the spouses because they were, were in that age group that they were still have a working life. And for the men, it was different, because there you see that it was 50% that was working full time. So they got help in, an, in a different way than the women. And it was not that uh, often they were on disability uh, uh, benefits or at sick leave. Uh, at, uh, and some of the expression was uh, distancing, experience and transform, spouse and relationship. Life is changing. Now I try to laugh at things. Now when I know what it is, they try not to correct all the time. I can't bother about tri uh, trifles. But for me, it is not trifles. When I said something, I felt he did not bother to listen to me. It just passed through in a way. And in about the social isolation, arranging relief is complicated and sometimes not worth the effort. When new stories arise, other interest is felt as shrinking, lacking or being based on misunderstandings. And also the needing 
uh, assistance and relief don't try to explain if there are things he doesn't know, like or, uh, or disagree with, whatever happens. You should be quiet and controlled to use a gentle voice, even smile if you won't feel like it. Just put on a smile and say, uh, nice. So it is, and there is nothing more to discuss. And then a sum up of the findings. The study uh, finds marked differences between wives and husbands in the meaning, content, and sustainable uh, of care, and needs for support vary. Wives endure, endured more stress uh, longer than husbands with a greater emotional impact and negative health consequences, and their needs are more easily neglected. Husbands present their need more effic efficiently and uh, obtain public relief earlier. So when it comes to the conclusion, uh, women may need more support early during different stages of caring for a spouse with frontotemporal dementia and the young ones. They need gender sensitivity, person-centered support to live their own lives and preserve their, se their selves. But that is not only for these relatives, but it's for everyone. We need to work and do also our research on a person-centered way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jord. So we'll pass on to our, our next speaker now. So I'd like to welcome Barry Moss, who's been working in cognitive therapies since 1979 with a focus on gender, sexuality, and dementia. And he works tirelessly as an international voice or advocate for the LGBTQ plus community and dementia. You jumped me. <laughs> uh, Okay, device challenged, which, it's the green, oh, perfect, perfect. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to, to, to speak today. Uh, uh, hello, my name is Barry Moss. I'm a dementia advisor with the Alzheimer's Society. I'm a member of the LBGTQ plus community, and my pronouns are he, sorry, he and him. Welcome. I'm going to talk to you today about the LBGTQ community and the challenges to accessing support in social health care in the UK. We're going to talk about patterns of discrimination past and present, why people may not seek support, family of choice, and ideas on how you can change this. Despite recent advances in LBGTQ rights, LBGTQ older people are often marginalized and face discrimination. They are twice as likely to age without a spouse or partner, twice as likely to live alone, and three to four times less likely to have children, greatly limiting their opportunities for support. There is also a lack of transparency as 40% of the LBGTQ older people in their 60s and 70s say their health care providers don't know their sexual orientation. According to, this, to a study in the National Care Forum, the UK is home to an estimate of one, hundred, sorry, one million LBGTQ people living in the UK. One government estimate states that 5 to 7% of the UK population are LBGTQ+, and a further 1% of the population are trans and gender variant. That means there could be as many as 68,000 people in the UK that are LBGTQ living with dementia. Individuals may not reach out for services and support because they fear poor treatment due to their identity because the fear of the stigma of dementia and of, LBG, of being LBGTQ+. While dementia disproportionately affects people over the age of 65, younger people may also develop dementia, young onset dementia. 
and they face particular challenges related to their age as well as their LBGTQ status. HIV, which disproportionately affects men and LBGTQ plus sex workers, again, disproportionately amount of, of whom are trans women, have been linked to dementia. An untreated HIV diagnosis can, can lead to HIV-associated neuro, neurocognitive disorder, HAND, which can affect individuals of any age. Okay, now here we go with the device challenge. It's important to know a little bit about the LBGTQ history in the UK. Until 1967, sex between men was against the law in England and Wales, and until 1982 in Northern Ireland. Until 1973, homosexuality was listed as a mental illness in the manual used for mental health professionals in the UK. In 1980, gender identity disorder was added to a list of disorders in the manual used by mental health professionals in the UK and Northern Ireland. Let me see where I am. I'll catch up. Uh, in, uh, in the 1980s, the AIDS epidemic developed, which large numbers of gay men in the UK affected, uh, sorry, large numbers of um, gay men in the UK. It also affected the attitudes towards gay men. In 2004, the Gender Recognition Act was introduced, allowing transgender people the opportunity to have those to ch sorry, their chosen gender legally recognized via a gender recognition certificate. In 20, and sorry, in 2000, 2004, the Civil Partnership Act was also introduced, allowing same-sex couples to have their relationships legally recognized. In 2013, the, uh, the, the Marriage Act, Same-Sex Couples Act was introduced in England and Wales, enabling same-sex couples to marry and where am I? Oh, sorry, no. We'll come to that. Um, and then in 2017, as uh, only a few years ago, if you think in chronological, it was decriminalized in the Merchant Navy to be gay. That one still floors me. Although these more recent changes have been positive, it is important to remember that persons is likely to have lived through many of the negative experiences listed above. So that is some of the discrimination people faced. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about why people may not seek support. LBGTQ plus community members <clears throat> specific, uh, need specific understanding and support with their dementia journey. Older gay men have had terrible memories of being persecuted during the times before decriminalization. Transgender persons may revert to their pre-transgendered states. Now, let me catch up. I'm sorry. Um, there we go. Um, there are uh, over one million people over the age of 50 in the UK who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, non-binary, and gender fluid. Many people, particularly those who are trans, continue to be outed without their consent, treated with inappropriate curiosity and subjected to unequal treatment because of who they are. Mirroring the findings of the UK government's recent national LBGTQ plus survey, a worrying proportion of the LBGTQ plus people say that they've been pressured into accessing conversion therapies to change their sexual orientation and gender identity. This discrimination, both experienced and expected, can deter people from accessing help when they need it. One in seven LBGTQ plus people, including more than a third of trans people, have avoided treatment for fear of prejudice. Many LBGTQ plus people who are in later life have faced criminalization, as we spoke, invasive medical treatment, e.g. hormone therapy and electric shock therapy, violence from the, the, from the police as well as the public, and then being shamed and ostracized by their own communities. 
There are seven areas which can create un, uh, unique and additional challenges for LBGTQ plus individuals living with dementia and their caregivers. They are stigma, social isolation, poverty, health disparities, sexuality and sexual expression, barriers to utilizing existing services, living with HIV and AIDS. These can be compounded by some LBGTQ plus people do not see their biological family regularly. This could be for a number of reasons. Some LBGTQ plus people are part of a family made up of people that they're not biologically related to, sometimes known as a family of choice. You might be one of these people. Some LBGTQ plus people do not have children or grandchildren and their main relationships are with older adults. Some older LBGTQ plus people are more likely to be single and live alone. Multiple needs are often taken, uh, not taken into account, which affects some of the most vulnerable LBGTQ plus people. Some people aren't open about their sexual orientation and or gender identity when seeking medical help because of fear of unfair treatment and invasive questioning. One in eight LBGTQ plus people have experienced some form of unequal treatment for, uh, from healthcare staff because of their LBGTQ identity. A third of trans people have experienced unequal treatment. Trans Transgender persons continue to be outed. There's a fear of prejudice. One in eight, that's 13% of LBGTQ people, and a third of, 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 um, of trans, 32%, have experienced this. In 2017, in 2017 the National LBGTQ Plus Survey, with over 108,000 respondents, described a situation where LBGTQ Plus communities faced discrimination, felt their specific needs were not being met had poor experience and had major concerns about accessing health care, and that should be a right for all. At least 16% of survey respondents who accessed or tried to access public health services had a negative experience because of their sexual orientation. I have experienced this in the latest 2014. Oh. Oh, rush, rush, rush. Um, at least 38% have a negative experience because of their gender identity. One in five non-binary people and LBGTQ um, people, disabled people, both 20% have experienced this at one time. Similarly, one in five black, Asian, and, and minority ethnic LBGTQ plus people, that's 19%, including 24% of Asian LBGTQ plus people have experienced this. Most of the LBGTQ plus P, uh, community do not have traditional families, as we've, we've said and as, as Mary has said. Um, there are many to be, um, they're not, sorry, they may not be supported by blood relations and blood relations may have disowned them for being who they are, may not recognize their partners as spouses and do not understand the individual's choices and wishes. Within the community, we have a family of choice, a group of individuals who we consider our families, our husbands, our wives and close friends. Good practices are limited, but a rights-based approach, which regards dementia as a disability, is a helpful starting point. Involving LBGTQ plus people in shaping policies and practices on dementia care and taking partnership uh, approach between health, social care, and voluntary sectors um, are all important in meeting the needs and hopes of the LBGTQ plus community. There are a few simple ways that we can start to support the LBGTQ plus community. We can expand our definition of family to include family of choice, educate ourselves on LBGTQ cultural competency, find or create support groups specifically for LBGTQ plus people, partner with local LBGTQ plus community groups, Signposting to and or advertise LBGTQ and dementia support. Raise visibility. Did that change? There we go. Um, oh, there, oh, sorry, all this time it's been there. No! 
It's the blind leading the blind. <laughs> okay, I can see where we are now. <laughs> okay, expand your definition of family to include family of choice. Educate ourselves. Oh, we've done that. We're going, okay, raise, uh, raise visibility. Include visual indications that your space or service um, is safe for LBGTQ plus people. This could be a rainier lanyard. It could include imagery of trans people and same-sex couples. <laughs> uh, and, and include this on all your publications, in your social media, and on your posters. Finally, there's, I'm, I'm going to start, finish off with this last thing. This is, the, this is um, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about. Um, there is much to be done, uh, and, and there are many to support within the LBGTQ community. It is up to us to keep the conversation going and to support those who need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. Uh, so we, we having, we're receiving a few questions from the audience, but at the moment we're just going to continue with our last speech, which is on a slightly different topic, and then we'll take the questions at the end. So please continue sending the questions through on the app, and we'll address the questions at the end. So I'd now like to introduce Nigel Huller and Michaela Morris, who are going to speak about dementia-friendly Welsh Hospital Charter, co-produced with people affected by dementia. Do you want me to change? No, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Bonne da, uh, da. <laughs> Can't get the Welsh language right. There we are. Um, we're going to talk, talk to you uh, for the next 20 so minutes about the Dementia Friendly Hospital Charter. I was diagnosed with early onset dementia in 2012. Uh, I think we had to say at this juncture the two people sat at the front here were also involved from the early stages of this. Uh, so it's, it really is co production at the highest level. Hello, I'm Michaela Morris. I'm uh, working in Public Health Wales in um, the Improvement Cymru team. Um, and um, my background, I'm a mental health nurse, and I know sometimes that's frowned upon in the dementia world, but um, long-standing, and I really do appreciate coming here today to talk to you about the work that we're doing in Wales. So the Dementia Friendly Hospital Charter, um, how it started. So there we are, it's working. <laughs> So um, we've got um, a dementia strategy in Wales called Dementia, dementia Action Plan that has been um, in existence for a while now. Um, high level, came from Welsh Government. And um, as part of the Dementia Action Plan, there are a set of actions that are specifically for me, leading the programme for the National Dementia Programme in, in uh, Public Health Wales for the Welsh nation. And... Um, one of those actions was around developing a pathway. Um, and I think people were imagining this would be a process or a map that would be the pathway telling people what the journey should be from diagnosis to end of life. I never do things conventionally, so I went back to Welsh Government and said, actually, can we do it differently here? Um, let's, um, yes, I'll meet the terms, I'll have a pathway, but can we actually go out to the people and let the people decide what that pathway should look like? Um, and what materialised was um, in our engagement with over, we actually met over 2,000 people. We went across England, uh, we engaged with Scotland, there were people from Ireland as well engaged, and of course across our, our, our own um, nation of Wales. Um, did a lot of engagement, and what they came back with is said, well, what about a pathway of standards? We could have had 160 standards, and we used the same engagement, the same people, to actually say, what are the priority standards? So you tell us um, what they should be. And we developed the All Wales Dementia Pathway of Standards, which you can Google, it's online. Uh, there are contacts at the, at the end of these slides that you can get in touch with and ask some more. One of the standards was around what is it like to actually be somebody and, and experience care when you go into hospital if you have dementia. And also, if you're a carer of somebody with dementia, what does that experience feel like? So we determined, again, through co-producing with everybody, that what we needed was a charter for Wales, so a dementia-friendly hospital charter for Wales. 
Um, bearing in mind our pathway of standards is um, developed um, through four themes. So um, the journey of the person goes through accessing, and that's everything access. Um, being responsive, and they want to be responded to um, in the right way. And then what does that journey look like for people? And then it's really about people. I think, Nigel, you said that earlier. In, in, it's about people and relationships. And that underpinned everything um, by uh, how we live and breathe, I suppose. It's the Welsh way. Um, uh, kindness and understanding was really sort of the fundamental linchpin of what everybody told us. If you could just be kind, if you could just understand us. So that became the motto for our work. So we had this idea of a dementia-friendly charter. And again, we went back on the journey of engaging everybody to say, well, we're not going to write the charter. I'm fed up, having been 38 years in practice, of receiving everything from top down, told to get on with it. Um, and I wanted to sort of continue the theme. We're on this journey. Then uh, let's actually truly co-produce a charter. England has a charter, a hospital charter. We engaged the Dementia Action Alliance. They worked with us. And we said, do you mind if we do something different with your charter? Um, and we started doing all of the engagement, the workshops of what the Welsh charter for the Welsh people should look like. Um, so uh, in Improvement Cymru, we have um, a methodology, a framework that we work to called the delivery framework. And what we've decided to do um, is turn it on its head about issuing, issuing standards, issuing a charter, a set of principles, where we actually um, want to turn that into practice. So we've got a delivery framework. What does that look like? We went on the journey of learning. That's our learning cycle. Um, and we want the regions of Wales to be on that same page, really. How can we support them to learn? What does it look like in their region? What does it look like for every person in every community? Go out there and find out. So that's your learning cycle. So we developed a joint delivery framework with, that was national and our national approach. And then we're supporting each of the regions in Wales to adopt that delivery framework so that it's out there in the regions and they're also learning how they can do, do the same approach, use a delivery framework of quality planning, quality improvement and quality control to get it to spread and scale really. Um, because often we release things and they don't, translate into practice. So um, pandemic put, paid to a lot of our work, but we did carry on through virtual presentations um, to keep people connected. And we've delayed it. We've started our readiness the, this year. So we're now supporting the regions to actually try and deliver it. So the charter itself is made up of um, the RCN space principles. So it's about staff who are skilled, working in partnership with each other, um, having the assessment right and early identification right across the hospital, what care and support looks like within a hospital, and then what the environments look like within that hospital and how you can adapt change against them all. So it is a massive set of principles under each of those chapters. Um, but again, um, how do you get it into practice? So we discovered something called CareFit for VIPs. It's a tool, a self-assessment tool that University of Worcester developed, Professor Dawn Brooker and her team. And we thought, wow, this is a self-assessment that's online. Uh, so again, we approached them and said, could we do something slightly different for Wales? And um, what we ended up doing is working with them intensively <coughs> to create um, a Care Fit for VIPs hospital section. It's already there for everybody else in the world to use, but Wales ha now has its own section for hospital care. And we developed um, uh, the, the Care Fit for VIPs um, to have a programme, so there's a massive programme that's being developed to support over four, 500 wards and departments, seven regions across Wales, every hospital site. And we've also got independent hospitals as well. So our VIPs program, uh, the first phase we're currently in now, and that's actually where every region identifies where they want to start. Um, they're given the login, so it's not an automatic or we'll just tick the box and say we're doing it. We have, they have to work with us. 
So we develop the programme, we develop it with them, what that looks like in their own area. And then what we're looking to do is spread and scale that um, throughout 23 and 24, and then evaluate. So obviously what we're doing is getting ready, getting going, and we're asking them uh, quite heavily and strongly to get going. It's very difficult. Um, staffing is difficult. The pressure is difficult. Taking that breath, as Nigel always says, coming out of the pandemic, just breathe and then move on. It has been hard for everybody. So we're building that, that sort of momentum now, really. So what VIPS offers, they will do the self-assessment. There will be improvement cycles. They're built in anyway um, to CareFit for VIPs, the tool. But we've enhanced them, and we've got a river diagram approach. If anyone, you can Google the river diagram as well for improvement. And that gives you a visual. So if you've got four wards that um, are all in a medical directorate, those four wards can actually work together to see where they are um, on the river. They're in the river, the south bank or the north bank, and it tells you where to focus your improvement or to focus some of your funding. You can have those conversations around it. So it's a whole team approach, and obviously we're helping them achieve those principles and put them into practice by, by using this approach. So I'm going to hand over to Nigel, who's going to talk about co-production and how that, what, what that looked like for developing the Charter. I'll, I'll pick them yeah. for you. We've got five minutes left, we've got five minutes left so uh, that, that, that takes me past the uh, having to answer questions off, uh, off Michaela, because I don't know what the questions are. They're not likely to be, what's your two top favourite malt whiskies? We'll do the questions. <laughs> Should, okay, do you want to do the conversation now? Okay, <laughs> let's do the conversation Have we got now. time to do the conversation? Do you want to quickly say co-production? Yeah, we'll do, do the conversation now. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, off you go. <laughs> you can... I have no idea what the questions are. <laughs> like I said, it's not going to be what you're too top, but for, for anyone who's interested, it's Glenlivet and Lagavulin, if you're in a generous mood. See, he doesn't know because the page is turned down. <laughs> so, um, you're really big into co-production. That's your thing. That's my thing. I have a T-shirt <laughs> made. And I think you've spoken a lot um, about co-production and what it is and why it's important to you. But I just wondered whether you could share with everybody what it felt like to actually be part of this work. Was it truly co-producer or are you just saying that, Nigel? Uh, no, it's tr truly co-producer from the beginning. The theme of the conference is building bridges. And the only way you build bridges is if you co-produce stuff with the people who are receiving the services. So we, from the very word go, people affected by dementia, our loved ones and our families were involved in, in the overall development of the, of the uh, Welsh Hospital Dementia Friendly Charter. It's really the only way to do things. Uh, and I'm very fond of my quotes, and like Taylor Swift says, uh, the more the voices, the sweeter the song. And we certainly, I think, cracked cracked it with this. To give you an idea of the influence that we had on, on that particular development group, uh, the final meeting before the thing was published, I said, are we sure that we've got the document that we started off with? Do you remember? They all, I could hear him sighing, oh God, he's off again. <laughs> I said, take it away, have a look at it, and then come back. And from that, we suddenly realised that we drifted. We'd forgotten the quality. Diversity, it, it, you know, it, it, it just happens. So having people with the lived experience who, who've, you know, I come from a Romany background, so I know what that kind of, that kind of exclusion does to you. Mm. So yes, it was truly co-produced. It was there, but not big enough. Never big enough. Never big Never enough. Never big enough. So on the th theme of building bridges, uh, this is a particular bugbear of mine, we often hear um, the evidence, there's evidence that tells us projects, programs, standards, strategies don't ever really translate into making a difference. What's the impact on what we do up here on people's lives? And it's very hard to evaluate that. It's very hard to show it because often it doesn't get translated. So it's the so what question. So what we have a charter and so what we've got a program. What do you think is the key thing to get that translated into practice? When it opens up conversations, it's, it, you know, the charter isn't there to be a clinical perspective. It's there for people to look at the services they're providing. 
I win Wales with your thing called the Mammy Test. Is it good enough for my mammy? If it isn't good, good enough for your mammy, it isn't good enough for the people you're dealing with. So fix it. And, and all we want to do is give people a framework to operate it. Um, and we run, Michaela challenged me on how do we get people engaged. So we run a thing called part the pods. Uh, they were called... Positive Outcomes Dementia Space. Facilitated by people living with dementia. Right across Wales, to everybody who was involved in the care of people with dementia, dementia leads, clinicians, and we facilitated, saying to them, what do you understand about good hospital care? What does it matter to you? And we've got a, we've got a lady who works with us, her name is uh, Lady Living with Dementia, and her name is uh, Frances Isaacs, and she's our conscience, because she stops us in our tracks, and she says, hang about, what about this? And she actually painted the covers you can see there as well. Lovely. Have we got time for one more? Um, I'm just going to ask you what you've learned by being part of this. What is it in your learning well, well, to be part of this journey? I think it's, it's, it's slowly, slowly, really. Uh, we formed Clyside Dementia uh, to have an independent voice uh, on the way people are, are free of agencies and free of any organisational uh, uh, criteria. And just, just to get our voices heard. People living with dementia's voices are golden. Their testimony is bejeweled. It shouldn't be ignored, it should be encouraged. And what I've learned is, is that people, the more they hear of the, the evidence from people living with dementia, the more likely they are to think, oh yeah, the next thing I do, I'm going to ask people to, to join, a, join our group. And I think now co-production in Wales is stronger now than it has ever been. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um... Nigel has uh, given a shout out to Francis for the lovely pictures. They're all the way through the document. Um, the document is online as well. You can Google the Dementia Friendly Hospital Charter for Wales. And um, also, there's contacts from Nigel and myself. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we've come to the section for the questions and we have quite a few questions on the app and so please continue to, to put any questions also for Nigel and Michaela but you might be able to address those as well. I'll start with the first question which is quite a general one. Does the LGBTQ plus community ask for inclusive or separate support and care initiatives? Who would like to answer that? Hello. It's on. Is it on? I can talk about this for hours. Um, in, in a nutshell, I don't want to be treated um, any different than anyone else when we go in for, when we're searching for, for social health care. The issue is we are treated, we are di um, discriminated against when we go in seeking social health care. I'm going to share a little, a little, um, a little uh, uh, anecdote that might help you understand what I mean. Um, this is a personal experience of mine. In 2014, my husband and I were living in far north of Canada, in the Arctic, and I passed out. They took me to hospital. I was in a coma, in a deep coma. I was in a coma for seven weeks. My husband who, is, my, who is, is legally able to speak for me, was declined every time. We need to have somebody, a blood relation, who can vouch for Mr. Moss. I am, this is my husband, I can vouch. I, you know, I demand my special rights, rights that I can answer for that. The seven weeks, no. They continued and they continued and they continued. They called family of mine who I have been estranged from for 40 years to ask permission to have an, an invasive surgical procedure, an exploratory surgery, and yet my husband was standing right there. So that just illustrates, and this is 2014. This is not, 
in, in, in the 80s. This isn't in the 70s when, when there was outward discrimination. This was just subjective um, uh, and just persecution, I think, uh, uh, because we were LBGTQ. I hope that illustrates the, the question. Yes, thank you very much. Does anybody else have an, a view on that issue? Any of the other speakers? No? Okay. Okay, well, move on to the next question, then. This is for Mary. How can Alzheimer's societies become better allies and support our LGBTQIA community? Well, I think it's um, inviting people like Barry <laughs> and Patrick and Nigel to come and speak and to hear that perspective. What a powerful story. It wasn't related to dementia, but I think it, it uh, exposes and informs. You know, I love that Maya Angelou um, quote that says, until they know better, they can't do better, right? And so that's really the mission. I don't care what your cultural background is. You've got to inform somebody so that they can do something better than what they're doing. So I think that is really the mission, quite frankly. Okay, thank you very much. So then the next question, this is um, one to everybody here. How do you deal with ageism within the LGBTQ plus community? Another big question. I can't answer that, I'm invisible. <laughs> it's very well known that within the community, once you reach 40, you're put out to pasture. Um, but you know, it's, it's just one of those things in the community. Ageism is, is, is ripe in, in the LBGTQ community. Ageism is ripe in all communities, not just specifically to um, the LBGTQ community. Um, we, we see it every day in, in, in the way that, that people are treated who have dementia. You know, for, you might offer somebody who, who, who has young onset dementia um, uh, anything, any, you know, any medication to, to try and help them w with, with their journey. But when they reach a certain age of 95, that same medication that could benefit them for the remainder of their years um, is denied simply because they are 95 years old. So ageism is quite prevalent in, 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 um, in social health care. Yeah, I, w I would just echo um, Barry's sentiment that I think it's just ageism in general, right? You start with that, and then within each community, it's probably some nuances that we have to be uh, aware of, again. Uh, but I think uh, dementia is often seen as sort of like a normal <laughs> aging process, too. So I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. And for those of us who are in the dementia community or supporters of the dementia community, we have to educate that, no, this is a condition that needs to be taken seriously and supported, like any other condition. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we now have a question for Ord. So how can we encourage women carers to seek support earlier? Uh, I don't really know. Uh, I think it's uh, perhaps they try to stand up for the spouse for a longer time. That's perhaps one uh, way of understand it. And uh, I think uh, it seems like the men um, more often ask earlier also, and they also receive more help easier. I think it's something there, but we are different. People are different, so we can say the women and the men and those and those. You can't list it up like that, but it's interesting to just have a look at it, what happens. Absolutely, thank you. Then another question is for Barry. What can Alzheimer's organizations do to better support members of the LGBTQIA community with dementia? Um, safe spaces is, is, is the one thing that I'd start off with is, is to create a safe space um, so that, that they, can, they can speak to you honestly without having to hide what their, what, what their identity is. So with me, when, when I'm supporting um, the, uh, 
individuals with, with dementia and their, and their unpaid carers. I always, always, always make sure I've got a, rain, uh, a rainbow lanyard on or I've got rainbow laces on. Something subtle so that when they come in, all members of this grand and beautiful community I'm a member of know what the rainbow flag is um, and what it represents. So um, they will see it as a, as a safe space. Have, have your, your literature, like I said, have your literature um, uh, showing positive imagery of trans people, of that wonderful image of, of the two gents with, with the child um, and a biscuit. Having that on your, on your publications, on your websites, on your, all your social media. Um, even not just during Pride Month or Pride, you know, um, LBGTQ um, um, History Month, have it all the time. And then that way, it's just gen um, creating this really soft and warm, warm environment where people feel that you, you're trusted. You're not going to judge them. You're not going to, to bring your unconscious bias into the situation that it's going to be, a, you know, an honest exchange. And one more thing I'd like to add is, is the use of language. Please, please, please use appropriate language. And don't be afraid when you're, when you, when you're, when you're speaking to, to, to members of the community. If um, somebody who, who, who has, you know, is gender fluid, uh, you've got to watch, you know, you don't say he, she. You, you know, them, they. Use, use appropriate language when you, don't talk about husband and wife, talk about spouse, um, or, you know, or talk about your partner. Um, these things, just these little, little things will make it more inclusive and, and more of a safe environment. Thank you very much. And then we have another question for Mary. What guidance would you have to LGBTQ plus community on what makes su successful dementia advocacy? Please step forward. <laughs> please, 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 please step forward. Yes, if not for yourself, then for somebody who is entering this journey, um, maybe behind you, because your learnings uh, can number one help you know those who are following in your footsteps, um, or, and I also think that the more voices we hear, the more informed people will get. Because the thing is, it took. It didn't, I didn't have to search too hard to find individuals who are willing to stand up, but it can't just be one or two or three. It's got to be a lot of voices. And we also, you know, Mary, one thing that I didn't, um, you know, I love the statistics that you yeah, shared and yeah. everything, but I think in, in my personal life, I've known people who have gone on their own identity journey later in life. And so I think we really need to um, embrace that and understand that as well, because I think people are finding um, courage later in life to be their authentic selves. So I would just say, please speak up. Sorry, just going to jump now to a question for Nigel. What would you tell someone who is interested in doing co-production for the first time? What was the question? Yeah. Uh, what would you tell someone who's interested in doing co-production for the first what? time? What would you tell someone who's interested in doing co-production for the first time? Uh, well, be prepared to work hard. <laughs> be, be, be prepared to, to, to be open and honest. Uh, I said in my, my talk at the symposium that people that put their heads above the parrots parapets, particularly people with a diagnosis, are brave beyond words, you know, really, because you're going to be challenged. Um, you, you're going to have to make sure that your words carry the weight of the other people around the room. Find out where services are planned, find out who's in charge, and say to them, where's your voices? Where's your lived experience voices? Let's make, let's make this a totally inclusive uh, activity with co-produced outcomes. Um, and then you'd be surprised that once you get in the room, what can happen? Um, it, it, it is, I said earlier on, it's a transformative experience. It, it really is. And you come out feeling empowered. You come out feeling that 
the, the diagnosis may have diminished you in some way, but not really, because you've still got that ability to contribute. So I would encourage everybody, if they've got something to say, say it, and find a venue in which to say it. Uh, and make sure, and make sure you're supported in, in a way. Make sure you, when you go to the meetings, the support is there for you as a person. They haven't got 15 or 20 point agendas, and you know, there's space on that agenda for your voice to be heard. Great advice, thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, so then, another question for Ord, I suppose. Can carers receive disability benefits in Norway? Uh, what, what did you say? Uh, can people receive disability benefits in um, Sick leaves, uh, they can have for some uh, months, but uh, that's all, yes. And then the next question is also for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, what interventions do you think could help wives reduce their stress for supporting a spouse with young onset dementia? Uh, I think it's very important that when, the, when there is a person that uh, receives dementia, uh, young or older, they should have someone to contact early, just when the diagnosis is there. And it's uh, information to the whole family, not only the spouses, but also the adult children, so that they have a common knowledge of what this is about. And then they should have someone to call. And if they don't call, they should be called every six months. It's not important that they need something, but you know, have contact with, the, with these families all the way. Can I just say something on that note? There are little posters the other side of the door dotted all around, and they've got a QR code on them. And that's asking people to comment on exactly what you've just said. Um, what does a connector do? What do they look like? Um, what should they be doing for the person? Um, because we're trying on that, we're trying to go on that journey, but we want to find out actually what should it look like. So um, that connector and that person to contact whenever diagnosis to end of life is vital. But we have lots of different ideas about what they should do and we want to bottom that out. So I would urge people to go on the QR code um, and, and have a go at answering some of those questions. Okay, then another question, um, not sure about the word. When working with mixed groups, how do or should we call out the use of inappropriate language? Um, I, I need clarification on uh, the, the term mixed groups. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, you're only allowed a certain amount of characters. I had to squish it. Um, basically, when you're working with mixed groups, like I used to work in a dementia day centre, and sometimes other people living with dementia might use terms that are maybe un-PC or outdated. But, like, should you ever call that out? How do you do that in a way that's, like, constructive, but you're not telling somebody off and making them feel singled out, especially if they may forget and say that term almost on a daily basis? So it's just a bit of a, a tension with that. <coughs> I, ne uh, I never confront. Um, I never... I never um, I'm say I'm sorry, that's inappropriate, change your language. Uh, that's very confrontational and, and it doesn't get you anywhere. What I would do is saying, oh, well, that's a very old, old way of, of putting it, but now we use this term instead. Um, it's a very gentle approach. You're not reprimanding. The, you, you've got to remember that people in, in, that have advanced um, dementia sometimes we'll see that as, as a personal challenge to them and then the regression, you, you, all you've done is, is made them angry. Um, so it's just using a very softly, softly approach. Thank you very much. And sorry I misinterpreted your question actually. No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So we just have one last question, and maybe each person on, on the table could answer this one. If we meet again in a year, what will a successful year of advocacy have achieved? That's a dilly. <laughs> um, I think for me, success will be appropriate language. That's all I care about right now is appropriate language. Um, if we can get that within a year, it has taken homosexuals to start to get accepted within society uh, since the first case, you know, Neo Neanderthal came out with his boyfriend out of the cave. You know, we've been, we've been doing it for, for, for millennia. But if, um, just like that commercial that's on in the UK. Um, so if language, if you, the use of appropriate language and respectful language. I think just basic social, social graces, respect and language. In a year from now, I would love to have normalization of all different cultures represented. In a year, I would like to uh, that it was uh, that we are talking about such thing as this uh, in different rooms and also in this at this congress. You you need to have a symposium with this topic. Uh, I suppose with my improvement head on, should we have a baseline from today of what we all think it looks like today and then actually um, evaluate it and test it and then see whether we have actually created any better understanding of what this is in, in life to be real with advocacy. I guess, uh, are we talking about the greatest achievements or the achievements or what we're looking for? I However mean, you would like to interpret it. Uh, sorry? However you would like to interpret it. Well, I guess it's, 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 as chair of the Three Nations, I've taken it to a place where we now run webinars. Uh, we've run them since the 20th of April, uh, uh, since April 2020. And we've engaged nearly 80,000 people in that time. Uh, and that's... Webinars devised, developed, delivered by people with a diagnosis, with oversight. That's a remarkable achievement. The amount of engagement that we, 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 uh, we're involved with on a daily basis, where people are coming to us now and saying, well, we want to hear your voices. And I'm all about the voices, not the one voice, everybody's voice. And the work with Michaela and, the, you know, getting whales on a footing that understands co-production. I keep on saying that, and you know, if you invite me to these things, I'm going to talk about it all the time. Um, and I, you know, I get to the stage where I'll probably empty a room quicker than anthrax, but I will, <laughs> I will talk about it because it, I believe it's the magic bullet. Thank you very much. Before we close this session, just a few words from John. So just uh, well, introduce myself first. So my name is Jean Georges. I'm the director of Alzheimer Europe, and I just really wanted to say that I really enjoyed this kind of meeting, and I also really take on board that uh, we need to continue this kind of discussion, and we're not going to continue discussion in a year's time, but I think we want to continue that throughout the year as well. So it's not once a year at a conference where we suddenly discover that we need to discuss gender, sex, and sexuality and dementia, that we need to talk about the needs of the LGBTQ plus community. And uh, so what we want to do is like, I'm sure there's lots of good work being done by the people here on this fantastic panel, but also within your organizations, your associations. So if you have anything that you would like to share, please let us know. We really want to find good practices, best practices, and share them as widely as possible so that we already have good ideas when we're meeting in a year's time with really fantastic initiatives that I'm sure a lot of you might be working on. So let us know, because the more we know about these issues, the more we can share them more widely and see them hopefully applied in other European countries. And with those wonderful words, I end this session. I would like to thank our magnificent speakers and thank you all for attending this session and thank you all the people online who also attended and sent in the questions. Have a great conference.